Good afternoon. I met Sarah, uh, Sarah and Harry uh, a few years ago. Sarah and Harry were related to a friend of my mum's. And um, my mum got in touch with me to say, um, Sarah and Harry, Harry, Harry Hutchins is gravely ill. He had cancer that had come back for the third time. Um, and my mum said, they live near you. Could you get in touch and just offer support? And I thought, how on earth can I help them? Um, I eventually phoned Sarah, uh, introduced myself, and went to see them. Went with Dean, two of us went together, and Harry was incredibly ill. He, he you know, the colour of someone's skin um, at, as they're near death. He was incredibly ill, sitting back in his armchair, very weak. He was 53, very, very weak, and he didn't have long. And Dean and I chatted with Sarah and Harry, and we prayed with Harry, and we left. And after we got back um, to, to chat about, together about ha Harry and Sarah, we were thinking, he hasn't got long. We need to offer him Jesus. And I went back the following week with David, and... David spoke to Harry about, you know what, we want to pray for God to heal you. We believe he can. But actually, whether you live or die, whether you're healed or not, what you need is peace. Peace with yourself and peace with God. And he then went on to very simply explain how Jesus brings that peace through all he's done. And he said to Harry, would you like Jesus to give you that peace? And Harry said, yes, I would. And it then became my job to pray with Harry and to help him commit his life and eternity to Jesus. What a pressure that was. Oh my goodness. This prayer, this prayer better be good. There is eternity riding on this prayer, I thought. What on earth am I going to say? I'm not prepared for this. I'm not necessarily, what do I know? So I began this prayer that needed to be good and it was slow, and it was meandering, and I could feel my face going red as I was praying, and I'm thinking, I'm gonna cause Harry to go to hell here. <laughs> and as I eventually drew this meandering prayer to a close, I said, amen, and I just thought, I've blown it. And I looked up, and Harry, who had been sitting back in his chair, sat bolt upright and went, amen, amen, amen. And I thought, Harry has just given his life to Jesus. <laughs> and it was an incredible moment. I remember leaving there. I used to work in the golf industry, and I just said, I used to sell golf sticks for a living. No nothing I've ever done in my life could compare with what I've just been part of there. The very following day, Harry went to a hospice and died one week later. Have you ever read about the thief on the cross? Jesus does that today. He is incredibly merciful, incredibly gracious, and he longs to and loves to reach out to people in all circumstances because he longs to and loves to save people. Sarah phoned me a few days after, and we're talking, and she said, could you speak at Harry's funeral? And I sort of said, I don't know him. <laughs> what can I say? I sort of said that. I said, look... Um, Perhaps I could just share um, my interactions with Harry, the prayer that he prayed, and what that means for him for eternity. And she said, that's great, you've got eight minutes. And um, I'm at the funeral, and I shared, this is what, and everyone who knew Harry, he was um, life, of the, life and soul of the party, loved a drink, and none of them would have imagined this guy had become a Christian. And I'm just sharing what happened to Harry. And I read from Revelation 21, where it says, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. He will be their God, and they will be his people, and he'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or sorrow or pain, because God, who is seated on the throne, will, wipe, will make everything new. And I said, did you know Harry became a Christian, he gave his life to Jesus, and he is with God right now, and God has made everything new. He is not sick anymore, he is not ill anymore, he is with God, and God has wiped his tears. And talking of tears, everyone in the um, crematorium was sobbing as I was talking about what Jesus had done. 
and I thought, I need to go to the wake. So I stood at the bar at the wake for about three hours at this golf club, and it was a bit awkward because I'm having a conversation with someone, and then they'd go. And then 20 minutes later, someone else might come. But eventually, lots and lots of people just kept coming up to me one by one. But there was lots of gaps, and I drank seven halves of lemonade, and I had lots of wind. But um, <laughs> by the time I left the golf club, three people had signed up for Alpha, including Sarah. Sarah came on Alpha, and bit by bit, she was, through her grief, she was hearing about this incredible guy called Jesus. And you could see him start to work in her life. After several weeks, she started coming to church. And it would break your heart as you see her during worship with tears pouring down her face as God drew near. And talking of tears again, when she became a Christian several months later, they were falling out of my face. And I'm thinking, what a merciful God you are. And it began with the worst prayer in the world, but it didn't, that was never going to stop you because of who you are. The story will go on, and you can read more about it in my book about a partner she met a few years later called Simon and how he became a Christian. God is incredibly merciful, and that is the beginning really of what I want to talk about, because God has a heart for lost people beyond what we seem to believe. Sometimes we can believe I was an easy one. God can't save them. Have you ever thought that? Subconsciously, is it in there somewhere? He can't save them. Have you ever thought about how incredibly passionate and merciful God is? Luke chapter 15, Jesus wants to just bombard us with the grace of God for lost and broken people. He tells three parables, one after the other after the other, because the Pharisees are saying, look, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. So he tells three parables the parable of the lost sheep and the shepherd who searches and searches and will not give up and is passionate to say, I'm leaving the 99, I must find that sheep. And he doesn't give it a telling off or kick it back to camp. He carries it on his shoulders and says, let's celebrate. And he throws a party and Jesus says, did you know that's what God does with every sinner who repents? He tells another parable and again it finishes with, do you know God throws a party amongst the angels in heaven over every sinner who repents? And he tells a third one, just in case we don't get it, about the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. And the way I picture the father after the son has gone and you can get this picture as you think of the father who sees the son a long way off. You don't see someone a long way off unless you're looking for them. So I picture the father every morning, like on the balcony, on the veranda, going, will my son come home today? Will my son return? How my heart longs for my son to come home today. And then he sees his son a long way off, and he runs to him. And he wraps his arms around him. And the son wants to apologise. He's saying, there's no time for that, son. The robe goes round the shoulders. The, the family signet ring on the, the finger. He puts sandals on the feet and he says, let's throw a party to celebrate. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He, is lost. he was lost and is found. Jesus wants us to know how passionate he is for people who are a long way away from him. And I think if we start to believe how passionate he is, it will transform how we see other people and how, how possible we see. What, what, God, what, what might God do? What might God do? Because he saves people who are lost and broken. When my first decade of being a Christian, I was a militant preaching evangelist who genuinely, after dinner, would pull out a preach from my back pocket while my friends... More full then, with relaxing on my sofa, think they got a nice evening ahead. I'd pull out a preach and I'd tell them how they're sinners and they need to repent and they need to pray a prayer now because you never know, you might die soon. That was my after dinner conversation with my friends because I thought, I've got to save them. I've got to save them. And I remember after 10 years of being a Christian and I, was, I think I was the most hardworking, most fruitless Christian evangelist you'd have ever met. And I remember praying a prayer after a full decade saying, God, I can't do this. I can't save anyone. And I remember just sensing God say to me, I'm glad you've worked that out now, son. Would you do things my way now? And it was a shock to me. But then as you realise, you, you start to read in the Bible, you, you read again and again, salvation belongs, it doesn't say to dub. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't say salvation belongs to dub. Salvation belongs to the Lord, we're reminded 
oh, so I don't need to try and save someone. In fact, I'm not supposed to try and save one, someone. Oh, okay, right. My picture of evangelism was really skewed. And I think our, our picture of evangelism can be skewed by really pushy Christian salespeople like I was, or the soapbox preacher. Sometimes we can look at someone's personality that, that they sort of live out and go, oh, that's the model for evangelism. Mark Landra Smith the other night when he talked about, I'm just going to go and hang around in a supermarket, and he then had a conversation about crackers, pate, and angels through the Bible. Please don't think that's the model for evangelism. That's, that's Mark's personality and his gifting coming together with him going to do what God has called him to do. But that's not God's model for you. You can breathe a sigh of relief. Pate and angels is not the conversation you need to have necessarily. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Do you know what that means? The pressure isn't on your shoulders or mine. Isn't that a relief? I don't need to save anyone, and I'm not supposed to because there is one saviour. And by the way, he is good at saving. We can sometimes feel, oh, it's too hard around here. It's just this hard ground. We just need to cling on as Christians in our Christian bubble because they're never going to be interested out there. And then you suddenly read the stats that suggest that 2.5 billion people in the world today would say they follow Jesus. 2,500 million people would say they follow Jesus. And you go, oh, Jesus, you can save. You can save. Right, okay. But our people around us just feel too hard. It feels too hard. Okay, perhaps Jesus, you can save. You are the saviour who saves people. And so today, I just want to explain how Jesus' great commission to go and make disciples, how the only way we can fulfil it is through his great commandment to love. And as we bring those two things together, you get the name of the book, which is the name of the seminar, which is Our Principal Welcome Church for Evangelism, which is loving people towards Jesus. It's not loving people and saving them. No, 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 no. It's loving people towards the Savior who will save. And I'll tell you what I've found is my confidence in Jesus, the Savior, has grown and grown and grown the more times I put people in his presence. Because as you put people in Jesus' presence and they hear about him and he draws near, he saves people. And so loving people towards Jesus, that is um, how we do evangelism at Welcome Church. And it is really transforming because the pressure's off. And yet, as we love people towards him, he saves people. The interesting thing is, he genuinely does want to work through us. Um, Jesus said at one point, I am the light of the world. And we would all nod very quickly and say, you absolutely were. Well, you had the words of eternal life. You You brought miracles to people. You brought transformation. Wow. In, uh, is it Luke 24, when the disciples on the Emmaus Road were saying, weren't our hearts burning inside us? Wow, Jesus, that's what you've done to us. You were the light of the world, absolutely. You were the light of the world. And he then goes on to say to you and me, you are the light of the world. And we say, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No way. I know what I'm like. And you know what? What I've realized is when we hear Jesus say, you are the light of the world, and we say, no, I'm not, we can think we're being humble. And actually, that's not it at all. If he says to you and me, you are the light of the world, and we say, no, I'm not, we're actually showing disbelief of the saviour. We're actually saying to him, you're lying or you're incorrect. And we wouldn't actually believe that about him, about anything, would we? But in our over-humility and our awareness of our own flaws, we say, no, no, I'm not the light of the world. But Jesus would say to us, you are the light of the world. And he would say, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. For me, just choosing to believe Jesus that I am the light of the world has been so transforming. I don't need to save anyone and yet you want to work through me and you've made me the light of the world. I used to think, 
People were lucky to know me. And then I realized what an idiot I was. I now believe people are blessed as they experience me. Not because of me, but because Jesus has put his Holy Spirit in me and I will shine something of the love of God as I interact with people. That's not arrogance, that's faith. That's faith. That what he says he's done, he has done. And so I would just encourage you that Jesus has made you the light of the world. As you just choose to believe him about that, I I promise you, your confidence in what the conversations you will have will be will just grow and grow. Jesus, I wonder what you might do in my next interaction. I wonder what will happen next. Because Jesus, you're working through me. It's not about me trying to do all the hard work, but you're at work through me. And I, I would say it's, it's really, it can be revolutionary for you and I in our confidence that we believe, Jesus, you're working through me and you're shining brightly through me. The fascinating thing at the end of this verse is this. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As you love people and allow the love and the light of God to shine through you, It will lead to people being drawn to Jesus and ending up placing their faith in him and glorifying your Father in heaven. It's just quite incredible. And so my encouragement to you is this. You're not the saviour, the pressure is off. But Jesus is shining brightly through you, so the light is on. And as you choose to believe that, you will see him work through you. And I'll tell you what, it is so exciting to be part of what he is doing. In the next, however long I've got, I'm going to go through 169 pages of a book. So I'm going to whistle stop through. And if you want to know more, you can pick up a book at the back later on. What loving people towards Jesus looks like. I would say that we're in 21st century post-Christian Britain And it's worth recognising that. I think as you look through uh, the Gospels, you look through the book of Acts, where people were hungry for things of God. You think about Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. People were hungry for things of God. It feels to me in our post-Christian country that people aren't ready for you and me. They're not ready to say to you and me, would you preach to me? Get that preach out of your pocket after dinner, Dub. They're not necessarily saying that. In fact, they're not wanting that as a first port of call. And so just one principle I find helpful in our context is care before you share. Allow people to know they are loved before you, before they feel You're forcing your beliefs on them. People, God will warm people up and will take people to a place where they will become ready to hear. But in our culture, in our context, care before you share, I think is a very helpful principle. We've got a picture of Dan and Susie. At Welcome Church for years, we had a a groundsman called Colin. He was a lovely guy who'd been part of the church for decades And as someone who was on staff at the church, I knew that Colin loved a chat. And he loved sport and he loved his family. And he would regularly talk about his daughter Susie and her husband Dan, who were living with Colin and his wife, um, with their kids. And uh, he talked about how Susie had sort of drifted away from faith and Dan wasn't a Christian. He was saying, Dan loved football and golf, and I'm thinking, me too. And he said, I just would love Dan to become a Christian, because he knew what a difference it would make for his, sis, for, his, for his daughter, Susie, and the family. A couple of weeks later, I was introduced to Dan. He was a really nice bloke. We talked about football, and we talked about golf. And care before me, you share was really in my mind, because I'm thinking, this guy, the last thing he wants is for someone to preach at him. And as we chatted, um, he, he was talking about how keen he is on golf. So I invited him to join me and a couple of friends from church at a game of golf at a nice course that I had access to. And we had a game of golf. And during the golf, we talked about the really important things of life. Whether Fulham would get relegated. 
and whether it was a six or a seven iron for the next shot. It was really, really high stakes conversations. And Care Before You Share was just, I was just aware of the principle. We got on really well. He had a couple of, they had a couple of kids at that time that were similar age to our two eldest. Uh, and so we, we had things in common, sport and kids. So we invited them around for lunch uh, and the family came around. We just started hanging around, hanging out with them a bit. After several months, we, uh, we had an alpha launch with a comedian who looked exactly like Dan. In fact, I think the comedian looked more like Dan than Dan did. It was really strange. And so I, I just thought, I'm going to give him a, a fun invite to Alpha. So I just said, Dan, I want, you to, I want to invite you to come to our Alpha launch. Um, I explained in, in a nutshell what Alpha is, just very simply. And I said, but, but that, this evening is just a, a comedian and some food. And by the way, you should come because the comedian looks more like you than you do. Um, and he laughed and he said, yes. He then messaged me a, a few days later. He said, could my friend Russell come? And I said, no, he can't. It's only you that I'm interested in. So... <laughs> Eventually, I backed down and let Russell come. Um, so him and, him and Russell came to, Alf, to the Alpha launch. And at the end of the evening, I was really excited to see that they had signed up for Alpha. And over the weeks, you see him softening and softening as amazing truths about Jesus got revealed. And at the end of Alpha, they had not come to faith, but they were getting closer. So their group just continued to meet uh, around their, their host, Mike and Lou's house, just week by week, just to have food and to chat and just to g- continue to explore faith. And a few months after that, Dan became a Christian and got baptised. Absolutely incredible. And suddenly you see him bringing his wife and his kids to church every week. Wow. The main thing I want to do today is to encourage you, so I will continue to share stories. Cool, this is, is this the graveyard shift or what? <laughs> Straight after lunch on the final day of a long conference. So I'm going, to share, I'm going to continue to share stories with you because firstly, I think it will keep us all awake. But secondly, I do want to ground um, what I want to talk about in terms of loving people towards Jesus in the reality of lives change, because this is not a theory. This is about lives. This is about individuals. Um, among, amongst the 15 or 20 things I could say about what loving people towards Jesus looks like, I'm just going to say one other thing. Sometimes loving people towards Jesus requires patience and perseverance. And I know I'll be speaking to certain people in this room as I share the story of my brother-in-law. <clears throat> my brother-in-law, Clint, when me and Tanya became Christians about 20 years ago, Clint was very mocking and condescending about our faith. He uh, was a real, really loved science, and so therefore he knew that science had disproved God. And so when we're having conversations, he would just like sneer and snarl. He later on said, yeah, I was a a sceptical agnostic. And I'm going, no, you are an aggressive atheist, mate. You are horrible. So we very quickly learned you can't have conversations with Clint about our faith. And so the conversations just couldn't happen for a while Okay, and years and years later, about three years ago from now, so it's like 15 years or so after we'd become Christians, all of a sudden, Clint and his partner Magda were going to move, and they were looking to move in a certain direction. They end up moving into Woking. And if you drew a straight line between our house and our church, I reckon their house is right on that straight line exactly halfway between the two. That's my slightly over-exaggerated estimation. Um, And in the Bible, Acts 17, 26 to 27, um, Paul talks about how God has decided where and when people will live so that they'll reach out and find him even though he's not far from each one of us. And I'm thinking, God, have you helped Clint move right between our house and our church in order to help him reach out and find you? So suddenly, from we can never mention faith to Clint, I'm thinking, I think God might be at work. And so I started to invite Clint to like our life group barbecues, just getting to know other people from the church. Our building launch was coming, which was two and a half years ago. And um, I'm thinking, I really want him to come. So I was building up to it, getting him to meet other people, and made the invite for him and Magda um, to come along. 
And he said, yes. And I'm thinking, what? I can't believe it. He said, yes. So they came to the building launch. And as they left afterwards, they and loads of other friends of ours had been invited and came. And they all came back to ours for lunch. It was mayhem and so exciting. And they, amongst others, they were saying, we found it really uplifting and inspiring. And they came again the following week. And the following week. And the following week. And then lockdown happened. And then we had to move Alpha online. They wouldn't have done Alpha in person because they had a young kid at the time, Emily. And suddenly it was online, so he was like, well, we could do it online. So they did Alpha online with us. And I found him slightly, me and Tanya hosted a group with with those two, Clint and Magda and and four other friends of ours. And again, I found like he was wanting to disprove week by week. And um, I found it quite hard. And at the end of every evening, Tanya's going, oh... That's so tough. Why is he even coming? He just wants to like show us how rubbish Christianity is. Why is he... And we get to the end of Alpha, and um, I have a really interesting conversation with him about him suddenly saying, um, yeah, I... there might be something in this. And we, we recorded, I think, seven Alpha stories, which were short videos of people saying, uh, who invited you to Alpha? What were you skeptical or nervous about? How did you find it? Would you recommend it? And I said to Clint, could we, sh- could we shoot a video of you talking about what, you know, your story of why you did Alpha and how you found it? And um, so we did. And part of what he said was, um, I was worried about being the one with all the, 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 um, the skeptical views. But actually, my skeptical views were listened to and the conversation was good. And he finished off by saying this, um, I went from zero interest in Christianity and God to doing Alpha realizing afterwards that it was the start of a new, ongoing spiritual journey for me. Can I encourage you, and there'll be lots of us in the room, who will have people in our lives, probably family members, that maybe you've just lost heart of because you're thinking it's never going to happen. Can I just encourage you to continue to persevere because God continues to reach out and seek and to save now, Clint is going to re-sign up for, for Alpha, and he said, this time I'm going to do Alpha, but not from a skeptic's point of view, but from someone who wants to believe. He isn't there yet, but boy, he's getting there. Can I encourage you, if you've got people in your life, to ju- let God re-stir hope in you for them, re-stir faith in you that he's not done yet, because he is a faithful God who seeks and seeks and seeks and saves John 4, verse 35 says this. Jesus said, Look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see that the fields are ripe for harvest. Now, the context of that conversation was Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman at a well in a hard and dusty land. The disciples were going, We shouldn't even be here. It's just like, we need to be going, you need to go and preach the gospel. And why are you here? And he's had, Jesus has a, an incredible conversation with the Samaritan woman. The disciples come back to him. And they're sort of almost thinking, like, why is he talking to this woman? And why are we even here in the first place? And um, they're asking him questions. And he says, look, lift your eyes and see that the fields are ripe for harvest. And as they lift their eyes, they see many, many, many from this Samaritan woman's village following her to come and find Jesus. And you read that many in that village come and place their faith in him look up (laughs) look up is really my point to come out of this Um, I think that as you believe God is continually at work and as you believe that he is an incredible saviour who is passionate for lost and broken people and as you believe he wants to work through you we were reminded earlier on I think in one of the seminars my father is always working Jesus said and so When we leave our front door, we're not trying to start something from scratch or trying to drag faith out of death. No, Jesus would say, my father is always working, so so look up, look up. And as you do, look up with eyes of faith. You will see God at work in all sorts of places, in all sorts of people, and it is just incredible. Me and Tanya, during lockdown, we, um, our, our youngest, Ethan, was at a nursery at the church 50 yards from our house, uh, a Church of England church, lovely little nursery. And because I 
am an alphaholic. When I see an alpha sign, I just notice it, right? And so I just noticed a, a, a week or two before, there's a big alpha banner on their outside wall. So you go past it, and then the, um, the nursery's in the building just ahead. And anyway, one morning, we take Ethan to this nursery, and there's this guy who just sort of, just sort of looks like he wants to talk. He's sort of smiling, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I know him. I thought, probably should just go and say hello. So I just went over and said, I don't know if we know each other, but I'm Dub. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm Darren. I've seen you on the school gate, but our kids have never been in the same class. And um, just remember, care before you share. I'm just going to break this principle right in this next story, okay? Um, <laughs> because we're talking principles and we're talking about the power of God, right? So it's not, we're not going to create rules because he does what he wants to do. But anyway, we, be, we begin this conversation and really quickly in the conversation, he said, what do you do for a living? And I'm going, that's really annoying. I don't want, you, I don't want to tell you that because I want you to get to know me first because I want to care before I share because I want to have time for you to know that I'm genuine and I'm going to be your pal before I share my faith. And I'm an outreach pastor at a church and you've asked me within a minute. I'm so annoyed. So I just said to him, oh, I'm an outreach pastor at a church in Woking um, called Welcome Church. Um, part of what I do, I thought, I'm in now, I've, I've got to say. So I just said, um, part of what I do is I run uh, things like our Alpha course. Have you seen that banner? I, I, I run the Alpha course at our church. Now, if, Jesus, if our Father is not always working, where does that conversation go? Nowhere. Because I haven't built this to this moment, have I? But if our Father is always working, then something might come of this conversation. So yeah, I, I run Alpha amongst other things. And Darren says to me, I've always wanted to do Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, this is amazing. This is amazing because God is always working and he is passionate for lost people who to us seem too far to be reached. I've always wanted to do Alpha. And I said, well, it starts in two weeks. Can I sign you up? And he signed up. And on week two, who is Jesus? He said, Darren said, I think Jesus is the world's greatest ever illusionist who never did miracles and yet tricked people. And I'm like, I'm not another Clint. This is just a nightmare. <laughs> a nightmare. And it was online, okay? It was Alpha Online. And what was funny about Darren was, you're, the screen is looking at his box. You know the little box on Zoom? And the screen's looking at his box, and behind him is like his patio door windows that then reflects back. And so as I'm chatting, as we're having conversations on Alpha online, I can see there's two screens the other side of him. One's his Alpha box, the other is the football that he's watching while we're doing Alpha. <laughs> um, anyway, so Jesus is the world's greatest ever illusionist, is what he says on week two. He finishes Alpha, and it was summer last year, and then we're doing Alpha in person October last year. And I said, Darren, I think you should do it again. Um, so I'm thinking he's not there yet. And um, he did Alpha in person, and our very final session was our Alpha Holy Spirit Saturday. It isn't always our last session. It's not a rule. Don't get sort of too caught up on that. But that was our final session, Saturday the 15th of January this year. And him and another long-term friend of ours, Haley, who came on Alpha, I'm thinking on the final session, I don't know where you are. I've got no idea. So I just, I thought, I've just got to ask them. I've got to ask them. How are you guys doing? Where are you at? What, what do you make of Jesus? What, what are your thoughts? And they both individually said to me in their own words, but they both said like almost exactly the same essence of their message was, yeah, I, I've uh, become a Christian on this Alpha. Um, and I just went, in my head I'm going, that means all sorts to all sorts of people. So I said, what does that mean to you? And they said, um, they both said in their own words, um, I believe Jesus is who he says he was. I believe he was God's son. I believe he came to earth, I believe he died for me, and I believe he rose again, and I want to follow him for the rest of my life. And, <laughs> and it was another dub moment where tears were just falling down my face, and I'm, I'm going, I'm really sorry, I'm not really a crier, I'm really sorry, it's embarrassing, but I'm just overwhelmed with how good God is, and the fact that you've become a Christian. We've got a picture of Darren coming up, and this is a picture of, uh, there's me on the right, there's him at the back with his head down, that's us praying for him on Easter Sunday uh, when he became a Christian. Isn't it incredible? I've, I've put his quote, he sent me a message a couple of weeks later and I've just put it on there because I want to encourage you that people are grateful when we introduce them to Jesus. We're not giving them, it's not like medicine, just hold your nose and it'll be over soon. We're, we're giving them the water of life. We're giving them, we're introducing them to the saviour who transforms people and when he does, people are grateful. And so Darren said, hi mate, I wanted to text to thank you for introducing me to Welcome Church. I have a lot to learn but feel really committed to my faith 
and know that I'm closer to Jesus than I've ever been, in brackets. I don't think he's an illusionist anymore. I owe you a massive amount of gratitude. As you open the door for people to encounter Jesus, they will be so delighted. You're... <laughs> and I would just, we're, we're going to go into just a little pause for you to just chat and answer three questions we're going to put on the screen. But let me just encourage you. We have a saviour who loves people and is much more passionate than we are about him introducing himself and transforming their lives. We have a saviour who wants to shine brightly through you and impact people through your life. And as you love people and love people towards Jesus, and the next section will be about loving people towards Jesus, how to help people encounter him. As you help people encounter him, you will see people come to faith. We're going to have, <clears throat> I reckon, five minutes. Five minutes just to chat and answer. The, and pick, pick a question. Pick the question you really want to answer and sit next to someone and just talk about it. And I'll bring you, us back together in five minutes. If you're not near someone, go and sit, go and sit with someone and have a chat. Okay, less than a minute. We'll, get, we'll, we'll keep going. I'm, I'm aware that time is continuing to tick and I've got um, four hours worth of content to do in the next 18 minutes. So we'll keep going. Um, loving people on purpose is the final... Um, it's not the final section, but it's the next section. Um, let me just um, tell you something that would be really odd, right? If we love people because God has poured his love into our hearts and then we have no intention of introducing them to Jesus, I would say that is one of the weirdest forms of love, warped forms of love that I can imagine. How would we ever allow people to experience the love of God through us and not let, let them meet him for themselves? And so for me, with every person that I meet, I long for them to know him. My greatest ambition for someone's life is not to enjoy the fruits of a friendship with Dub for the rest of their life. That would be pretty average, to be honest. But I, I long for them to know him. And we can love people without purpose, and we never actually get them, help them come to encounter him for themselves. And so there's an intentionality um, for you, for the more salesy people in the room, there's a strategic element to this. For the more cuddly pastoral people in the room, there's an intentionality in this. And um, we have to surely want to introduce people to him. So loving people on purpose towards Jesus is really key. You can see it with um, ministries and missions that end up just becoming, we're just here to serve you and there's no plan for him. And that's, we cannot stop there. And you know what? God is strategic. He is intentional. 2 Samuel 14, 14 says God devises ways so that people would be saved. We learn that Jesus came to not, not wander around aimlessly, but to seek and to save the lost. And he was sent at just the right time. And we heard earlier on today that, that Paul became all things to all people so that by any means possible, some would be saved. We are to be strategic, intentional, whatever word you want to use, so that people can encounter Jesus. So our role is like the doorkeeper in the old-fashioned manor house, where it, these days, you might just open the door, hello, in the manor house, the, the doorkeeper would open the door like this and would stay behind the door. And so the person at the, on the doorstep would see the Lord of the manor down the corridor. And similarly, our role is not to be the star of the show or to be the one in the way, but we're to open the door and get out of the way so people see not the Lord of the manor, but the Lord of the harvest. That's what our job is. So how can we do it? How can we get people that seem so far from God to come to a place where they can hear about Jesus and come to faith in him? Again, these are like principles, and God works in whichever way he wants, but just some principles that seem to regularly be true for, reg for lots of people. The first thing that someone needs who's, who's not a Christian is a Christian in their life who is normal and loves them, and that is you. You're step one, and that's really, really key. But there's something that John Burke calls relational momentum, which is really key as well, and I found that with numerous people that I've seen come to faith, that if I just become their only Christian friend, you end up getting stuck. 
But if you can introduce them to other Christians, which is what relational momentum is. Relational momentum is helping people meet other Christians and the momentum of those relationships will help people draw closer and become more open towards God. And you think of it this way. One star, one star will shine in the sky. But how bright and wonderful is a sky full of stars? And as in a similar way, as the light of the world, as people can encounter many lights of the world, they will be drawn to Jesus. That is what happens. And so that's part of our role, the relational momentum of introducing people to other Christians. And then the final thing is a safe environment where they can explore the Christian faith. Alpha would seem like just a great example of that. At Welcome Church, I would say Sundays also are a great part of that. And um, I was going to share a story which I will save, but there is, it is a favourite of mine, and I'll just point you to it. Page 116 and 17 of the book, story of Matt. I challenge you to read it without sobbing. I challenge you. Um, and so where do we make the invites? Um, and what role can we play specifically as churches? You might be a church leader, you might be an elder, you might be on the leadership team, you're here at a leadership conference. So I guess that your role in your church probably has a leadership element. And therefore, you and me need to take some ownership of some key things that are gonna really help our church get on this mission of loving people towards Jesus. So question, what can you and I do to help people in our church love people towards Jesus? And I've got three um, cultures that I want to talk about that I think are really, really key. The first one is creating a culture of welcome. What does the new, new person experience when they come to your church? How easy and accessible is your website or your social media? How clear is it about, for example, where your Sunday meetings are and what time it starts and finishes and what people can expect? When people are trying to get to your church meeting, do they know where to park? When they park, is there someone with a smile helping direct them to the next place? When they get towards your church building, have they got someone with a smile opening the door for them? Um, as they walk in, do they get given, I don't know if I can mention brands, Nescafe or a fresh coffee? What, what sort of... Um, Hospitality do you offer in your church? At Welcome Church, we have a pastries budget and we have an amazing discount that we get from a local supermarket and there's just a level of, I'd say, extravagance that people experience as they come and get a fresh coffee and a pastry um, on a Sunday morning. And I can name names of friends of mine. Nick's in this book. You'll, hear, you'll read his story about the only reason he said he came back to church was so I can get breakfast again next week. Um, that is all right. That is okay. By any means, we want to draw people to Jesus, even through pan au chocolat. So what's your hospitality budget? Could you stretch it a bit in order to just give that feeling of we want you to know you are valued by what you experience and what you receive from us? If you do an event, is it free? If you need to charge, can you charge people in your church, but let guests come free? What quality of food do you serve? A principle we try to hold to at Welcome Church is we will not, we try to, Steve's laughing, we, this is what we try and do. We would not want to serve food at an event or an alpha night or anything else that we're doing hospitality, anything lower than we would be happy to serve people in our own homes. Is that the, the bar you've got, or do you give people the good stuff at home and the cheap stuff at church? Perhaps that's just something we can think about. We know the gospel is a challenging message, a call to die to yourself and follow the Saviour. And we're going to present that. But what we don't need is to put unnecessary barriers in the way. So how helpful can we be in terms of our, of our culture, of welcome, that help people know they belong, help people know they are loved, that they're welcome, that they can just be in and around your church before they come to faith. <clears throat> what about a culture of understandability? It's a long word. Um, I don't know if it even is a word or not. I made it up, perhaps. Um, what is the focus of your Sunday mornings? Is it primarily or solely to teach and feed Christians? 
Or is it at the other end of the spectrum, shallow end preaching just for guests? Whatever you decide, it is worth recognizing that if as churches we focus our Sundays only on the Christians in the room, we shouldn't be surprised that the non-Christians not, in, not yet in the room are never going to come in the room. What's really fascinating is this, that if you want your people to invite people to church, they need to be thinking for quite a while, week by week, I wish my friend was here today. And so there's something that I question about the guest Sunday. That is the, like the one-off moment where we're just teaching Christians, teaching Christians, teaching Christians. Might look a bit weird to non-Christians. But hold on, we've got a guest Sunday and it's going to look really, really different. My, my question on that is, firstly, are your church confident to make that invite? Secondly, what happens next week? That's the big leap, isn't it? It's one giant leap for mankind. Go from guest Sunday to uh, Christian Huddle Sunday. So how, how, what happens? How do you do that? Um, at Welcome Church, we are looking for double impact preaching so that Christians can be fed and non-Christians can understand and have a message that is relevant for them as well. And both are possible at the same time. Um, Tim Keller is excellent to read or listen to on podcasts about the whole subject of double impact preaching. Let me just say it again. If you want your church to bring their friends to church, they need to be wishing they'd done it week after week after week, and eventually they will. So you need a culture of understandability where they're going, I've got to get them in the room. I've got to get them in the room. Can I just add questions for you to consider? And I'm not going to solve this for you, but just, let me just pose questions for you. Um, what do you do in terms of the use of spiritual gifts? I think that there's a real spectrum of feelings and thoughts, and I would say as a movement, we highly value the spiritual gifts. But what's really interesting in 1 Corinthians is Paul talking about using gifts to the point where he's saying, outside of a walk in and say, you're out of your mind. How can we honor the spiritual gifts and still have our people saying, my friend should have been here today? A culture of understandability. If you want to get your people bringing their friends, this is really, really key. How are you doing in this culture of understandability? Your number of Non-Christians any Sunday will give you a clue. How regularly you're opening the baptism pool will give you a clue. Now, these aren't like, we haven't had a baptism for 12 months, so we're rubbish. I'm not, I'm not trying to overly push it. But you know what? Jesus is passionate about people being saved through your church. And so us getting this area right is really, really key. A culture of invitation. And this is... Uh, this is really important for individuals and groups, like small groups, life groups, and it's really important across ministries. This is like a, an all-play, joined-up mission of invitation that we need to try and get in our churches. So what are you doing as church leaders to create invite moments for your church? Are there low-bar invite moments that, you, that they can make that are, that are before Sundays? Um, at Welcome Church, we, we try and create lots of stepping stone invite events to help lots of people across the church invite lots of friends to be impacted by the blessing and the kindness and the normalness and the love of the church. Um, three years ago, as we're heading towards our building launch two and a half years ago, uh, we created what we called the hop, skip and jump of stepping stone invite events. Now you picture the triple jump and how much further someone goes with a hop, skip, and jump compared to one giant leap of a long jump. I think the principles of stepping stone invite events, maybe you could get the picture. And we felt, you know what, if, if people can just come and just enjoy the stepping stone events, two things could happen. Firstly, the Christian in the church will be building confidence for that Sunday invite. Well, my friend has loved this event and that event. I can do this. I can make this invite. So we're actually helping them go further with their invites by helping them make low bar invites. But secondly, for the guests, 
all of a sudden they're going, your church is great. They're normal. They're kind. They're generous. Yeah, I'll come along on Sunday or I'll come to your Alpha launch. That was our hope. And so we did a fun day three years ago and we had 500 guests who came to it. I reckon something like 350 people between them brought 500 guests. That's probably the number of inviters and invitees. And out of those, 460 then signed straight up to our fireworks night. And suddenly they're getting two invites, two events, two opportunities to be impacted by our church. We then head towards our, invite, our, our launch Sunday, which is a big invite moment for us. And our num- numbers shot up on week one. So our numbers had gone up by 700 on week one. And suddenly we're going, that was just amazing. And we had a, a well-planned launch Sunday, which was around Jesus and his heart for people. And we shared what we called a welcome story, a really powerful testimony of, a, of someone who had recently come to faith and all Jesus had done in their life. And so we had 700 guests there and we're thinking, that is incredible. And I remember us, us sitting in the office on the Monday going, are any of them gonna come back next week? <laughs> Don't know. The following week, 200 of them came back. And the week after, 200 of them came back again and again and again. And our church had grown by 200 people off the back of a hop, skip and a jump and building confidence for the inviters and the invitees and then just, just being mindful about what, does it, what, are, what are we going to do on those Sundays. Just, it's going to really speak to those guests in the room. And then lockdown came. And we've been rebuilding again since. We had a, we're doing the hop, skip and jump this term again. And you know what? Because it went so well three years ago, our church didn't bring 500. We reckon our church brought, brought 1,000 people to our fun day. Wow. What confidence we're helping to create and what buy-in the church are, uh, are making. Sometimes we can think our church will never want to reach out. We just need to help them. We just need to help them. And I'm so excited as we head towards an invite Sunday in January to think, wow, God, what might you do? A culture of invitation, you'll see it spread bit by bit by bit across your church. I was going to read you Olive's story. I don't know that I've got time. I'll read you Olive's story. So these are Olive's words I'm going to read to you. My eldest daughter was in the same class as Will, Esme, and Zoe. Will's my son. Esme's the daughter of, a, of, of friends of ours in the church. And Zoe is a daughter of friends of ours, Matt and Bridget, whose story you can read in the church. And all of us were in the same class, or the, the kids were. Um, my, my eldest daughter was in the same class as Will, Esme, and Zoe. Being a mum without any close friend, family and friends, facing the never-ending challenges of life, I ended up a lonely, angry, and sad person. All my adult life, I've always blamed everything on myself, the friendships that fell apart, the loneliness that I faced, the trust that I didn't have. I can tell you a significant moment for her was when all of her friends from the school gate left the coffee shop and just disowned her one morning, and there was three left in the room, me and Helen from church and Bridget from church who stayed and just got alongside her And that was a really significant moment for her. I had no directions as to what's right and what's not. It was a messy place in my head. In 2019, Dub and Tanya invited the class to a fun day. I saw the invite in Kimia's bag but didn't want to go. I thought, what if people are standing there with Bibles in their hands, asking me questions I don't know the answers to, judging me, wanting something in return? We went along and guess what? There There was no one holding Bibles in the air, no difficult questions and no judgments. It was a fun day. It was fun. The generosity and the friendliness of people was unbelievable. I then went to the fireworks night. I also had a great time and thought to myself, it's only fair if I go to the opening of the church to show my appreciation. It was one of the best things I've done in my life. Yes, the people are friendly. The coffee is good. They also feed you and look after your kids. But that's not the only thing for me. It's the way it all makes me feel. They're my family. Better than family. Welcome Church is my safe place. (laughs) They put a layer of protection around me. I've made friendships that are deeper and last longer than any that I've ever had before. I've lived for 42 years and moved to the UK 25 years ago, and I finally belong somewhere. After my marriage broke up, I thought, oh, here we go. I have to start elsewhere. I have to start looking elsewhere. I may be judged and not accepted. But Hanukkah and the single mums team proved me wrong. 
My children love their church. I bring my friends who equally love this church and want to come back. You feel the presence of God and his son Jesus there. It's a magnet that pulls you in. If there was a Google search for what should I do in life, it would be welcome church. It is welcome church. Come happy or sad, they are there in force. Life group is my social life. Need someone to go on holiday with? No problem. They have the camping weekend away. Anything that you're short of in your life, Welcome Church will help you. I now know the real meaning of the body of Christ. Now I belong. I just wish I had come sooner. So, as I wrap up, can I... Feel free to buy the book. It's a fiver for you today, okay? Um, Steve suggested you buy it for everyone in your church. I, I'm amazed. I'm not very clever, but God's put something really profound here, <laughs> and it's happened to use my hand to do it. I think it would really bless you in your church. Um, as I draw to a close, let me just give you some things to think about. Firstly, who is championing, championing loving people towards Jesus in your church? Who is heading up outreach for you? Invest in them. Give room to their voice and listen to their suggestions of shaping. Invest in them. Can I tell you, we run as a movement equipping the emerging evangelists. And I would say out of the 50 UK churches, there's maybe a dozen that are sending someone to there. If you're not sending someone, why not? And get started. Speak to Ed Mellish or me and send people because they will get equipped to be a blessing to your church as you reach out to people around you. Can I pray for us? And then we'll draw to a close. Jesus, you are absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. I, the stories are magnificent because they reveal your grace. They reveal your passion for lost people and your perseverance and your determination to reach out and woo people to you and save people and bring forgiveness and transform lives. Jesus, you are magnificent. Jesus, thank you that we're not talking about a high bar of evangelism, but we're talking about something that all of us in this room and everybody in our whole churches can do, which is to love people towards you. Jesus, what an empowering message you've given us. Jesus, I want to speak on behalf of everyone in this room. You said in uh, Matthew 9, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. And Jesus, we know that you weren't just literally saying, just, just ask me to send people, but you're also wanting us to re reply like Isaiah did. Here am I, send me. So Jesus says we want to go back and equip our churches. We want to start by saying, here am I, send me. Jesus, would you allow people across this room... Would you help them to know you've equipped them to love people towards you? Would you allow them to, to have the utter joy of seeing people in their lives coming to faith in you? And would you allow them to be a stirring and a blessing to their churches? Jesus, I pray that our, our movement of churches would, would so regularly see baptisms and full alpha courses and new life and guests on a Sunday. Jesus, would you do a powerful work across our churches for your glory? Amen.